All right, uh, my name is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Tuesday, February 5th, and I'm interviewing T.G. Smalling for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at the Judicial Building at the State Capitol, where D.G. has an office. D.G., in addition to your many other accomplishments, you're an artist who works in multiple media, perhaps best known for your technique of single line drawing. You've had an international upbringing, but you're very much connected to your Choctaw roots, which are a major influence on your art. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Pleasure. Can you talk a bit about where you were born and some of the places you lived as a child? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my parents were in seminary and grad school in Texas, in Waxahachie, uh, Texas, when I was born. I had the sensibility at three months to bring me back to Oklahoma. So, came back to Oklahoma, and um, you know my my family being chopped off. Well, my family split because on my father's side he's he's um, uh, Dutch or Frisian actually. Uh, that's where my last name comes from, and then he's also Comanche, and so his grandmother uh, was a was one of Kwana's children, you know, and, and so it's. And you know how that is. There are heck a, well, there are a heck of us, a heck of a lot of us Parkers, man. <laughs> I mean, and so there are a lot of Parkers, which is kind of cool too. Being in the Oklahoma Judicial Center, he was not only the last war chief of Comanches, but he was the first tribal judge. And so we actually have several of his portraits here, which is really cool to see him here. And uh, so I digress there. We went back to southeast Oklahoma uh, to. Uh, Hayworth. Uh, we always had a house around Idaho, but uh, we, my parents, were pastors, and so we went to. We went actually, I should, okay. From Waxahachie, went to Plant Blanchard. Okay. From Blanchard, went back to Southeast Oklahoma to Hayworth. From Hayworth, we went to Lausanne, Switzerland. My parents became missionaries, and they worked sort of like NGO work or non-governmental humanitarian stuff, but they were very much missionaries. I went to Switzerland and Lausanne for language school. I went to the, Amer the American uh, Common well, the Commonwealth American School in Lausanne. So are we talking middle school kind of? No, or? Okay. I was elementary. Elementary. Um, went to Cameroon, Central Africa, to Douala, which was the port, the major economic city, port city of the country of Cameroon. Uh, and then from Douala I went to Yaoundé. So in Douala I went to the, uh, the International the International American School. And then when I went to Yaoundé, which is the political capital uh, in the, further in the, in the in interior of the country, uh, went to the American International School there. Went to Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, went there, I was ending uh, junior high, going into high school, or the transition, and so I went to a uh, South African government public school uh, in Johannesburg, Sandown High, um, where, and um, that was at the tail end of apartheid, mm -hmm. wow. and that was weird because, you know, there wasn't a uh, racial classification for me. Mm -hmm. So then my dad arrived, and you don't really see much of the Comanche in it. You see very much the, that Frisian in him. And you know, oh, cool, we got another Dutch baby. <laughs> I arrived, and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> and did then you, went to university. Yeah. Did you come then back and forth to Oklahoma? Did Absolutely. you have a relationship with your grandparents Absolutely. on either we side? Absolutely. We would come back, you know. And when I came back, I was always to southeast Oklahoma, always to. Um, around m just north of Broken Bow, mm -hmm. my clan town is Ponkybok. Ponkybok is, um, if you can believe it, something is is east of Broken Bow. <laughs> 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 about halfway yeah. between Broken Bow and De Queen, Arkansas, wow. there's a, or De Queen, uh, is is Eagle Town. And about a couple miles south of Eagle Town is Ponky Book. And um, you know, then that's 
our major client down. I also have clan relations with Honobia or Honobi, and, uh, was, and then we also have my fam. My my grandfather moved my his family out of Ponky Book and Eagle Town to just north of Broken Bow, uh, Broken Bow or what is Holcha Town, um, and um, to a place called uh, Bethel. Mm -hmm. I, that's really where most of my family are all right in that area. Do you have other members of your family that were like artistically inclined or extended family? On my dad's side, quite a few, and surprisingly enough, more more musicians, more musicians. Uh, cousin John Moore is from that area originally. You know, he started playing, but he's bluegrass, and he started playing Grand Ole Opry when he was thirteen, with with his sister. She was a little bit older, and. Um, on both sides of the family, very musical, mm. and on my grand, on my mother's side, which I, you know, more attached to in terms of my my tribal side, obviously. But I'm I'm neither more attached to either other. But uh, it, it it was fascinating how the role of uh, the all night singings, mm. you know, at church, because my my grandfather, you know, taught this. When he came back from World War II, he only had one. He only had two employers his whole lifetime: the U.S. Army and Choctaw Nation. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was kind of funny, you know. He, there in North Bethel, at the church, which was also the community center, which had the church or the the, the you know the uh, school. And it was all right there, and they lived a mile from it, and they still do. Well, my grandmother still does, and you know, so there was always music. One of my aunts beaded up until her death, and you know it was a very good beater, and uh, but didn't do it enough, unfortunately. And you know there was a lot more. Yeah, uh, you know, it was strange. You know, you could tell that um, there was a divide between family members who were trying to understand what had gone on. And displacement, and then those who had they weren't interested. So, when did you see your first piece of native art? I have no idea. My grandfather, more than likely, he kept things on his desk. That's probably where it was, because I mean. I had blankets made for me, so actually that would have been the first because those were my my birth blankets. What was your first experience making art? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's been a, it was always around, you know, drawing something, you know, painting something, building something. That was always norm, you know. I really, I don't know. I don't have one. I know I can tell you like, when I realized I could do something with my art was different. I mean, I was in Switzerland, and we would listen to the radio all the time, and because trying to get something that was in English, and and so we would listen on the short wave. We would get stuff from Voice of America, Radio Freedom, and other things. And there was one station that played um, these radio. Uh, theater dramas and I was about eight or nine and they wanted a they they asked to submit a for a competition uh, of you know some of the people or like the kids listening submit an art piece you know for competition and I did and it was in Swit it was being broadcast out of Geneva and we lived in Lausanne which was like 40 miles away and so I did. It was the only time I ever did, and I won, which was kind of cool. I uh, thought it was interesting. I could do this, and you know, and I, I have, I have to think that for me, what saved me in terms of, for my, to, to think that I really could do something with the art was leaving. Mm -hmm. I think that that was critical, because when I left the United States, I mean, it's absolutely not a slam against my teachers. Uh, my, my elementary teachers at Hayworth, 
I, I have only the fondest of memories. And, and, and Hayworth, till, it still to this day, holds a very important place in my life because it is, for me, quintessentially the, the safest place I've ever lived. But when I left the, you know, Hayworth, and I left the United States, and I went to Switzerland, and went to a Commonwealth school, and I mean, it it is an elite school. I mean, it would be false to call it anything else. I mean, you know, we have art every day. You know, we have poetry every day. You know, immediately left. Third, I was in fourth, third, fourth grade, and immediately learning how to memorize Robert Frost and uh, painting, sculpting. It was incredible, and it. I think that year was the most pivotal year of my of my life. So you've got this wonderful, getting this wonderful background in the arts overseas. Um, already at that kind of junior high middle school oh, it was level. incredible because you know I I went I, I can I can't really emphasize how radical it was I mean when I mean radical not in a subjective or in some sort of idiomatic way but in a true sense radical experience because I left Southeast Oklahoma the week the week before Christmas and my godmother, my one of my paternal aunt, and her family uh, lived in Bad Homburg in Germany. They were working for IBM, and uh, got on a plane for the first time. And it was a 7:47 KLM, and they bumped us up first class. So not only have I experienced all this for the first time, you know, I'm this punk, <laughs> punk ass kid. I I spent the entire time in the cockpit with the with the pilots, you know, and and you know, and and I I, I would, I've always been a very curious person. I love adventure, and so for me, I was having a ball. We got to Germany, and I remember going to midnight mass for the first time and you know there it's new year's or christmas eve and we which that was a first i mean and then we everybody congregated the community congregated in the, this medieval uh, fortresses uh, court central court and and with candlelight proceeded into along this route to the the, the cathedral and went in and this first time so first time in a castle first time in a cathedral sitting down and for the first time ever hearing an orchestra and in this cathedral the full messiah with choir blew my mind blew my mind because my experiences of the castle, of the, of the cathedral, of the music were not tourists. They were participant observer. They were seen each in the proper context and mind boggling because I was, I realized, holy crap, what the heck is this? Where have I been? And and hooked me. Just hooked me. You know, from then on, I wanted to see. I wanted to see the stained glass windows. I wanted to see the sculptures. I wanted to see the tapestries. I wanted to hear the music. I wanted to learn how to read the music. I wanted to to get it. And. Uh, you know, for me, the art, it wasn't a matter of trying to get me in front of art. It was, I wanted to see the art. I wanted to see the aesthetic. I wanted to see things. And so, whether it's in Switzerland, in Europe, or, but then when we got to Cameroon, the richness of the African art that was there, the sculpture, which to me is the finest in the world, 
you know, I don't think that anyone can sculpt like the Central Africans can sculpt. They can sculpt anything. I mean, just anything. And their sense of, 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 of abstraction, and their, and their, it, was, it reminds me in many ways of like Alan Hauser's work. Just an innate sense of space. And because Alan, you know, talk about audacious, mm. you know. So I, I digress there. Did you have, you're having all these wonderful art experiences both in and outside of school. Um, when did you, did, when did you sell your first piece of art? Sell it? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was when I was in D.C., Washington, D.C. I was working for uh, SAIC at the time, this defense group. And just kind of, I needed something to do on the side. Oh, were you in your early 20s or? I was in my mid 20s. Mid 20s. And my mind was exhausted. And uh, I did some paintings for a psychiatrist. A series of paintings, seven of them, I think it was. Big ones. And she just wanted some flowers. And so I just did flowers, real simple, basic stuff. You know, for me, that was fun. I mean, I was able to, I was able to create without, you know, any obligation. I mean, aesthetically, they were, they were good, they're good pieces, but they weren't anything to think about, you know. They were just fun to do. Mm -hmm. Because the sort of stuff I was dealing with, with at the CIC on my, on my desk was really macabre and nasty stuff. Can you tell us what the acronym stands for? Scientific Application International Corporation. Does it help you understand what they did? No. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. So. Okay. so you get an undergraduate degree in political science mm -hmm. and then you got your master's in international studies. I did not finish my master's. I, okay. you know, I decided to do art instead. Okay. At the undergraduate level, did you take any more art? Or no, you... never did. Okay. Um, my, fair, my, my focus in those years, because my focus throughout even my undergrad and grad was in crisis management, was on the, the study and on the crisis and on the management side of issues dealing with terrorism. And so I did that with, I actually went to OU because of, one of, of a person. And I wanted to study under that particular person mm -hmm. who was very much in the United States the founder of that field, you know, 30, 40 years earlier. And, uh, and so I mentored under him and, and became his assistant. Then he sent me around and allowed me access to different places in the world to train and then also to work. And, you know, that's what I did. My world was not art mm -hmm. at all. But I never even conceived of myself as doing art as a full time, or I really never even factored in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you live in D.C. for a while, and I think you also lived in Czechoslovakia. You know? I'm not never Czech. I lived in Hungary. Hungary, okay. And then I worked throughout. I've I've done work in every country of the Balkans. Mm -hmm. How. Does that have an impact on your work today? Absolutely. In what way? When I came back from the Balkans, um, and when I had decided to do art, I took a vow uh, to my mother that I would never paint anything dark, cynical, and macabre. I know that too easy. And, you know, I, I don't believe shock art's even possible anymore. And I don't see why people even want to play with him. I think I may do it once. <laughs> I think it may it'd be more like an installation. And if I did it, you know, my shock art would consist of like an, like an empty room, big room, you know, and just when people are pretty much liquored up as they do with these things, and there will be no art on the walls, it'd be bare. 
And then I walk out with some butt naked little baby, hopefully crying. Not gonna make it cry, but if it chooses to cry, it just helps the moment. You know, get people's attention and look at it and say, look what you can never be. You can never be innocent. So don't, don't make others catch up with you so quickly. Were you in your 20s already doing these flowers just for fun? Are you already working kind of minimalistically? I, I, in high school and everything else le leading up to, I was the exact opposite. I did strict realism, strict, rigid, nothing abstract whatsoever, nothing. And when it was surprising for me, what happened was I went through some experiences in the Balkans that just necessitated me trying to communicate with women, um, particularly women who were, I mean, we're talking clients that, that were, um, or worked with groups that were clients, because some of my clients worked with rape camp victim associations, POWs and whatnot. And, you know, someone like me or showed up and, you know, probably didn't look and smell the most savory of individuals at the time, and probably wasn't, and try to get through to them that I wasn't like other men. And of course, you know, anyone who's been severely traumatized, especially when they have been drilled into this, like, Pavlov's situation and maybe five stimuli response world, you that they've that they they're chattel. That's how they think when they come out. And then I started drawing flowers because I would randomly start drawing and then I would hand it to them. And unfortunately I had to draw a lot. And so but I had to draw faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. <laughs> Newspaper, whatever, you know, on, on whatever, because it was showing, you know, and um, it kind of, it caught me because when I started trying it for other subject matter, um, I realized how much I had to concentrate. I had internalized proportion, an internalized perspective. I, it's drilled in me, and I was able to work then on very much applying, you know, that movement that anyone in, in art school does. That one, that one, you know, trying to draw with a line. I revert inverted the the reason for it, whereas most people do it to loosen up their hand and help them capture an image. Mine was the opposite. Mine was to exact my hand. The image was already there. It was to exact it. And I was after that minimal movement. And so that it wouldn't look like scribble. That it was just an economy of movement. So are you talking about the single line mm -hmm. work at this point? And I began to recognize the more I thought about it, the shit around me disappeared. And I was able to kind of leave for those brief moments what was going on and who was going on around me. And so it became very precious to me. And I began to recognize I did not want that external to filter in. I needed to have a very strict definition of compartmentalized action. So when did you begin doing art more full time? When I came back, um, this is uh, about 2002, 2003, actually we left like 2003. I, um, 
a woman who was very much like my grandmother. As a matter of fact, I've been every day since I was 19, just referred to as my grandmother, um, Kay Orr. Uh, she was the most important person in my life in terms of art. She was an artist there in Pasea. Her studio was right next to uh, Mike Larson's when he was there. Here in the city, in yeah. Oklahoma City. Yeah, and um, yeah, Tom, Tom Lee, the photographer, was there. You had also you had Claude Anderson, had all really interesting. Then you had uh, Studio was it Studio Six with the four ladies who were just up there, like Susan Sumas Sullivan, you know, and Watkins, and you know, it was a. So when I was nineteen, there, I would. In, a, in university, I would come and hang out and just work in the studio with her. And when I came back, she had pa just passed away. And she'd asked me not to come back to the funeral. And so I came back to help with her son to close up the shop and transition. And I did a full retrospective audit of her work. And, you know, people who had collectors and whatnot that came in with their work, and I organized that because I wanted, I wanted her grandkids. I wanted to have it. I wanted others to have a full sense of the body of work before, you know, it kind of dispersed, irrevocably. And um, so I spent a lot of time there, and the students started painting again, and I wanted to do it more, and so I started. And so when I started grad school. I recognized there was such a conflict there. I went into grad school way too soon after coming back. I should have waited a few years. My mind was in a very dark place. And I had a hell of a lot of healing to do. So when I quit the grad school, I didn't do anything else but paint. I just painted. And didn't give myself an option. I just painted and painted a lot and I had a lot of I, I figured that I didn't want to be like a lot of my father's friends or relatives who came back from conflicts and whatnot and you know waited till their middle age after they screwed up a few wives and a few sets of kids and I didn't want to do that you know I figured let's get it through now so it was the healing yeah it was the painting Absolutely. And I'm convinced the rigor of keeping that diet and that the, uh, keeping the strictness of how the art was used and what I ingested mentally. Like there was nothing, nothing dark. There was nothing cynical. There was nothing macabre. There was none of that in my life. I wouldn't allow it. Because I felt, and I have buddies of mine that still from those days that are here, that know me, or knew me there, and know me now. And um, I just figured the discipline that kept me alive would help me heal. Did you get involved with galleries when you were going through that phase, or not at that point yet? I did. I think it was 2006. What were some of them? I wanted to get in a gallery that had nothing to do with Indian country at all. So I got, first gallery I ever got into was in Little Havana in Miami. Uh, it's a gallery uh, called the Cremata Gallery. It's no longer there. They were a great couple. How did you find it? So, <laughs> I went, yeah, exactly. I went down to see uh, my middle sister and my now brother-in-law and they lived in, the, she lived in Fort Lauderdale. They both lived. She lived in Fort Lauderdale. He lived in Pompano, and, and I'd never been to Miami. I'd never been to there, so I wanted. I've always loved cigars, <laughs> and you know, I had my first cigar when I was quite young. I'm not gonna put say it because this is this is <laughs> in case my parents ever read this. You know. You can cross that out. No, they know I love my cigars. I'm not gonna tell them how early. But I got, I mean, first cigar, I knew I liked cigars, and uh, I wanted to go to Calle Ocho. I wanted to go to Little Havana, and I wanted to have a cigar. I wanted to sit down with a Cuban coffee, 
and I wanted to bitch at Castro. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do it for those reasons. I mean, how funny is that? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go down there and sit down with the old geezers and say, I hate him too. <laughs> just, as, just to say, yeah, I hate him too. All right, we're in common here. And so I went down and did that. And, um, and I was walking by these galleries and my youngest sister, she went to this gallery. She goes, this is good. You gotta put your stuff here. And I'm just looking around and she goes, my, my brother, he paints. You should see his stuff. And I said, what? And they said, really? We'd like to see your stuff. I said, whatever. You know, so seriously, we'd like to see your stuff. I said, you know, I, I have nothing here. I, mean, I just came down to see my sister. She goes, well, how long are you here? I'm here like two weeks. Make something. Show us. So, okay. Went by an art supply store, bought some paper, bought some, yeah, ink and did some stuff for them and they were like, we'll take it. So they were ink drawings. Yeah, these were all ink. They said, we'll take it. You got more? They said, I'll send some. All right, we'll take it. And you're doing one line. Mm -hmm. And what was the subject matter? I think those were all horse and rider, but they weren't necessarily native. You know, at that time, I, at university, though I could not, with my time constraints, you know, get involved with polo. You know, I come from a lot of horse people, and I love polo. I think it's the most glorious sport after rugby. After rugby. And, uh, and so I, I w if I could get to a match, I was at a match. And fortunately, Oklahoma has wonderful rugby, polo teams. You know, both OU, OSU have phenomenal teams. And you know, that was always a pleasure to see. So I did stuff that was based on polo. And I did some flowers. You know, that was, it was a fun little composite of things. And you know, I, I was a lot of fun to do. And it, it gave me a lot of confidence because, you know, I, I needed the validation that it wasn't because I knew anyone. I needed to know that the validation came from the work being alone on its own and that it wasn't because it was native. You know, that I was in a native gallery. And I've been, I've kind of, I've really shied away from that. Not because I don't see a need for it or that, and it's certainly not at all to speak ill of them. It's just, for me, I want my artwork to just be because I'm an artist and that I'm native that may be informed what my subject matter but it doesn't define what I do I mean it's very important but what's an early show or exhibition you had that you feel gave you some important visibility the most important show for me beginning was my first show it was because uh, I did it at Jacobson House out of respect for the, the for the Kawa Six. I have the utmost respect for those six artists, you know, and for Oscar Jacobson, you know, and Dussel, his wife, and you know, you know was it was it uh, was it Sister Margaret or Margaret, who was the woman? From Saint Saint Patrick's, who brought them to uh, uh, to uh, Susie Peters? Susie, was it Susie, one I of think the, so, yeah. I, you know that to me, to show in that space was important for me to do because I wanted to be able to show in that space as a sign of respect, but also validation of the work. You know. And was this? 2007 or? Six or seven. Six or seven, okay. Um, you've done a lot of commission portraits and just it's weird, fabu isn't it? fabulous it's assignments weird. like Tony Blair and Sandra Day O'Connor and Mrs. Howard. Two for her. <laughs> Two for her. I'm about to be my third in June. So, my first question is that's wonderful. Um, 
Are these portraits more realistic or no. are they suggestive? They're just like this. Okay. Um, what's hard, what's the challenge of doing a portrait of a really well-known person as opposed to somebody who's There not isn't so well a known? difference. There's absolutely no difference. Do you work from a photograph to start with? I don't with, want or? to. I prefer not to. Mm -hmm. How it, about Sandra Day O'Connors? How did you approach her portraits? Well, you know, when I was or asked... The, one. the The first one was rather on the spot. Uh, you know, Justice Cogger asked me to... to and, and, and at the time, Chief, Chief Judge uh, Roger, Robert Henry, he was Chief Judge of the Tenth Circuit at the time. They asked me to come to the Governor's Pavilion and to do a portrait of her. Wow. <laughs> pressure. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I had worked through my pressure. I'm, I'm pretty easy around pressure as an artist now. Um, you, the most pressure as an artist I've ever felt was when I deliberately started out on a project to get me over that feeling. I did a three-year series on drag queens in which I would go out to the clubs, to the residences, to you know be at the club, both out in the audience and then I would go in the back with them. And I did that because... <laughs> and you're working on site? Absolutely, drawing. absolutely. Okay. The worst lighting in the world. Worst lighting in the world. Worst audiences in the world. They're drunk. I mean, people around you are drunk, high, whatever. They're moving, dancing. And, you, you know, and that was very fortunate that the club owners, number one, and the, the, the queens themselves, number two, wanted this. They were cool with it. They, they would set me up a little spot and let me work. They all knew Kay, who was like a grandmother. They all knew her. All the clubbers knew her. So I had a rapport with them, but going in, and they understood that I wasn't there to be cynical. I understood that I was approaching them like I would approach a ballerina, like I was going to approach a native dancer. I mean, I am there to just commit myself to that moment on the paper. And, you know, it, out of respect, I showed, I gave each and every single person that helped me a piece. You know, that was just a sign of respect, you know. And so you took the project on for, did you say, three months? Or three years three I did it. Three years. Okay, so you, you talk, you're mentioning the clubs and that atmosphere, and when I first saw your video, because that one line drawing technique is very much action, a kind of action art, right? and it makes for a great performance. And I'm wondering if you're aware of the performative element a bit when you do it, or are you just so focused? I can be if I need to be. Uh-huh. That was part of why I did it. I mean, I wanted to be able to become so comfortable with the form and with the method that literally anywhere at any time with anyone, I could do it. You know, that was important. I wanted to be free of any sort of, uh, I wanted to know how to commit to exactly right then and there. And then I wanted to also, you know, there was a, there was a very practical part, part of it where, for me was dealing with the male form. I, up to that point, I'd never drawn a man. I mean, there's no point, you know. It's my, as Kay always says, she was my grandmother, so as, she, as my grandmother always said, paint what you know. Well, I didn't, I didn't care a thing about men, so I never drew any men. So I did. I I went about learning how to draw a man through using the drag queens from transitioning from the female body over to the male. So you're talking about some of the backstage stuff, yeah, watching yeah, the transformation, and it gave me stage. stuff that I never would have thought of. The richness of, I mean, when you have a subject. Of somebody that you're working with and as they're prepping up and suddenly it looks like it's right out of Hamlet where they're holding their whole you know the person is a blank canvas 
and it's that wig and it's this they're holding that the you know the the mannequin head and it's like right out of Shakespeare you know and and, and realizing that this person is projecting an alter ego here and and I, it was really interesting too to be in the room or in the space to to I developed a rapport with these people at a point that for many of them was extremely vulnerable that I could be quite that someone like me could be quite comfortable they or I should say they could be quite comfortable with someone like me in the room you know I, I, I did it for many reasons and it seemed like a very economic way of getting a lot done with one movement or one process and it worked it really worked because I had just completed it and then uh, I was asked by John Kirshner uh, in, this, in the Oklahoma Department of Commerce to go with them and there were several Native artists who went with the centennial celebrations there at the Epcot Center and I went and uh, at night 10, 9 out of 10 of the pieces they took with these drag queens I didn't have anything else. That's what I was working on. <sighs> and how was the reception? Then? I sold out in three days. And I was there longer than anyone. That's fair. I was there for... Uh, Harvey Pratt who wasn't... He had he was sick, so they asked, me to, they asked me to stay on. And so I did. Which meant that I had to start making stuff, some stuff then. And I, <laughs> you know... Co- Working in your booth. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I didn't break anything. You know, so what happened was uh, uh, Pat Riley, was it, was it? yeah, Pat Riley was coming out, so he brought some stuff for me. <laughs> some of my artwork he brought with me. <laughs> and, you know, Mel Cornshucker, he took some of my stuff back, or my, my equipment back with him, and it was weird. And uh, I, yeah, I saw it like that. It was awesome. It's mm-hmm. definitely because Disney then asked me, "Would you consider coming back and doing like artwork here more often?" So I started hanging out with some of the artists who did that. And I thought, "Oh heck no! Oh Lord, you know." It's because this is part of Epcot, they like to have artists. Yeah, it's a wonderful gig if your personality can do it. Mm-hmm. For me, I can't. My level of threshold. With people is not I mean I have to keep things compartmentalized you know I need to if I know that I'm going to an event or if I'm going somewhere public to do something public then I can you know I factor my factor in okay I'm gonna be there for two hours then after that I need two three hours you know just to hang out you know when you I'm need from, to be alone after it used to be worse it used to be like for I actually had it down as a ratio for every one hour public it was three hours private mm-hmm. you know by myself and it's not nearly I've gotten a lot better at it, but you know that that way for me at least when I go public I can commit to the publicity commit to that wholeheartedly knowing that there's a parameter on it and remind us quickly about the Epcot show. Um, it was to recognize the knowledge of Oklahoma centenary. of Oklahoma. And so they sent a contingent of Native and non-Native artists to the mm-hmm. Epcot. Let's talk a bit about your commissions for Choctaw Nation. What have they been? And They've been very broad in their scope. Um, they've consisted from some pieces that are really, you know, um, I've done, like, one series I did was with, uh, um, the Choctaw co-talker from World, co-talkers from World War One, and I did a series on that, and, uh, you know, that... And I lectured on that while I was there at NMAI. And 
it was fascinating to me, you know, to, to do something on that because, you know, that's a family issue for us because my great-grandfather was one of the first five co-talkers in the United States. And then I've done a, period, a series on Choctaw leaders uh, looking back from uh, from Tuscaloosa up through some of the Revolutionary War period leaders like uh, Tabajo, and then you have up through you know your War of eighteen twelve sort of circa with your Bush Mutaha, uh, you know, up, uh, you know Mashula Tavi and those, and you know, and even looking at some of the newer uh, leaders. It's, I've done work on just classic women's dresses. You know, and one of the things that I'm really kind of curious about that we kind of play around with it. We're not sure where and how to use it is I wanted, I want to eventually do a children's book series. You know, we're using two little a boy and a girl, his brother and sister, very much my, unfortunately not including my youngest sister, because she wasn't around, <laughs> but base it really on my myself and my middle sister, and you know what it was like when we left, and and we come back to our family, and so that that little you know, that that little uh, series we've been toying around, and bouncing back and forth. We haven't, and it's you know that it'll be done. It's just how we want to do it, and and um, they've been really good because you know. I, the art, yes, but I've also worked in the capacity as, as a delegate for them and envoy politically because of my family. Yeah, talk, um, why don't you talk a little bit more about the NMAI, um, the, the Code Talker celebration there. Can, what was a highlight moment for you? You know, it's kind of interesting when you had, when you had the, the French government represented there because that's critical you know World War I our co-talkers were perform. I mean and same in World War II but they were very uh, World War I every single co-talker took it to his grave it was top secret and they took it to the grave and so the only reason why we understand what they did now is because of the French government, not the federal government. We never would have known. But in 1989, uh, envoys of the French military arrived in Oklahoma and started going family to family, trying to locate these men. Most of them had died. As a matter of fact, all of them died at that point. And they were bestowing the, I, a knighthood to him. You know, it was the, you know, Chevalier de l'Autre de Mérite de la Cinquième, no, l'Autre de Mérite Combattant de la Cinquième République, the Order of Merit of, or Knighthood of the Order of Merit Combatant of the Fifth Republic. And so, what was very instructive to me was while the federal government has dilly-dallied on this, getting our medals for years, years. We're into decades now. It's finally done. It's finally done. For decades. The French government gave them knighthood in 1989. So I have them there it was important because it was important that the French and we in our relationship with the French, which precedes the Americans' creation, you know, it was important as a point of validation to say that our relationships are sound, our relationships are healthy, our relationships are strong. That's much more important than art. What are some of your do you do very many big shows at all? No. No. How about, and you haven't done Indian Market yet? No. But you do have a gallery in Santa Fe. I did. I think that I was talking with, uh, with 
with the owner, and I, I think she's going to move on. So I don't know if I'll, if I'll continue Santa Fe. I'm actually considering more up north in Canada. I'm really curious about what's going on in Vancouver, and then also, um, you know, over near Quebec with some of the art that's native. Mm -hmm. And I use my art more and more to pay for my travels to certain places. And so I more and more I'm like, where do I want to go? <laughs> oh, let's do a show here. <laughs> so you have to figure out a plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe not being sad about Santa Fe is because I want to go somewhere new. I like Santa Fe and I appreciate what it's become. But as you know, Santa Fe is made up of a lot, most made up mostly of artists not from Santa Fe. I mean, artists from the Northwest, a heck of a lot of artists from Oklahoma. And I'm just kind of tired of people that I know of or people that are clients of mine who are willing to drive to Santa Fe or even come to France when I was there, knowing where I live. No, where my studio is. Oh my gosh, you have you have to tell that story. You had an exhibition in France. Yeah. And you actually had clients come out to France. Yeah. To buy. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us how the exhibition came about. It was you know Russ Talchief and I have been talking about doing something in France for years, and God bless him, he put it together with the uh, with um, an annual show on. On paper and and so there was a group of native artists who went I mean it was that simple and um, it was very odd where you know, was the showing at the in Grand Palais and they went again this past year and, you know I it was beautiful a beautiful place you know for me it was nice to go well, hey it was funny because I've been to Paris, I've been to France, or my parents lived in Lyon, France for years. So, you know, I speak French fluently. So it's very good to be there with some of my friends. You were good to hang out with. Yeah, you know, and I could be translator. <laughs> and what was, I think my, I think the most, one of the most special times for me was, there was one night I got up, we left early, uh, from the Grand Palais, and they just set up the farmer or the Christmas market along with Champs Elysees. So literally, when you came out of the Palais, there you are on this Christmas market. And it went from like the Arc de Triomphe down to the Tuileries, and you're just gorgeous. And and um, do you know Kenneth and Brent Greenwood? Okay. I know I've them. Okay, well they have. Their, their boy, he, he's about, I think he was about 12 at the time. Somewhere around 12, 13, somewhere around there. And they were all going to meet up at this, uh, at a restaurant, a whole bunch of people. And I was going to go for a walk and he asked to come with me. And so I said, sure. So he and I just kind of took off and, um, Ran into Kyle Dillingham. <laughs> Kyle and Andrea. I mean, Kyle is one of my best friends. From Oklahoma. Yeah, the violinist. <laughs> and I, I ran into him on the street. I mean, he just got ridiculous. I mean, and it, it was really cool, though, to be with that boy and you know, kind of see through his eyes, again, what it was like when I was a boy, when I saw these things for the first time, when I tasted something for the first time, be able to walk there, and he was a good sport about it. And I said, you understand, you don't know jack or shit here. So don't say no to something. 
Just try it once. If you don't like it, you don't like it. No big deal. And he goes, cool. So we go through this and try this. Try this. Don't like that. That's cool. But you tried it. And, you know, and explaining certain things as we went along. You know, that was really interesting for for me. You know, I think that, it's surprising. That was the neatest memory that I had of the whole time was being able to kind of go full circle in a way. Plus, while I was there, I was able to uh, find, you know, when there was a, a grave, there was a grave site that one of the Awe or the Awe Dan, uh, people who went with George Catlin to France, she passed away there. There's a woman. And I found her where she was buried. I mean, it was, she's been long since removed because in Europe, because of space being a premium, you don't own a plot of land or your cemetery, you lease it. And neither George Catlin nor the, her husband or others from the United States understood that. And so she's long since been disposed of, but is able to get all that documentation in 30 minutes, which is awesome, which is like an all time first with the bureaucracy in France. <laughs> and, and I had to put on my charm. Man, I sweet talk those ladies. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it was shameless. <laughs> For a good cause. Hey, I wanted it. It was shameless. <laughs> it was it was pretty dang shameless. I mean, even then it wasn't legal. As a you know, they all they the nurse Cratchit bureaucrat just like, no, we cannot do this without as I was leaving, this little sweet grandmother, you know had folded the photocopies of what I needed up. And while I was talking with her, as a turnaround, she did this. She looked at me just kind of like this and slipped it into my book. And as I was leaving, I did, you know, I, I turned away from nurse direction. I looked at her, I winked and I, I just said, thank you. And uh, so. <laughs> okay, let's talk about your, um techniques a little bit and materials. Mm -hmm. um, do you work with special pencils? What kind of paper and pencil do you use? Uh, I use no pencils. Okay. Uh, I use inks mm -hmm. and paints. Um, Are they paper? acrylic? Or well, it, it's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. I'm not, the paper that I use primarily is a crescent um, cotton paper. The model number is a C1150. I use that for, it, I should basically say, on rare occasions I don't use it. Um, the ink that I use is primarily a Pentel P500, P700 pen for the rendering. I prefer the use of these pens. They, much more fluid and consistency, consistent about their fluid over more movements and larger movements. I like using gels because they can be exposed to sunlight indefinitely and not fade. I firmly believe that as an artist, if I know that I can use a product uh, that can provide a better and long-term, uh, you know, quality, I'm obligated ethically to do that, you know, and so there's a lot of inks and paints that I just won't use because I don't see the value in them anymore. So even though it's a spontaneous process, do you, do you have your concept or idea in mind before you start? Sometimes, I should actually say sometimes they're spontaneous. Most of the time, they're very much methodical. You've already planned something now, but you haven't done any preparatory sketching. It depends on how complex it is. Okay. You know, when we're dealing, when I'm dealing with a piece that, if I'm dealing with a piece that is large, I don't have the luxury of being able to step back for perspective. I have to map out placements prior, and those placements dictate 
how I flow because I'm not going to flow in a way in which my arm is going to brush over the ink work and smudge it. So I have to plan things out so that I minimize backtracking so it doesn't start looking like scribble mm -hmm. or get messy and you know conform to that economy of line that I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's almost more like a mapping process. Isn't it, it is. That is actually what it feels more like. Let's talk about your sculptures just a little bit because okay. we haven't been able to do that yet. Um, was the glass teepee series, was that your first sculptural project? Yeah, that series is, you know, I've done designs with jewelry, with uh, Jackson Jewelry up in Stillwater. They had designs, or they'd mm -hmm. actually created some of my designs. I like working that way. I'm not a sculptor. I'm, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a glass person. I'm not a jeweler. You know, I like to do design work, but, you know, I'm not going to go build a new facility for each one of these. And so, you know, my collaborations are very important, finding people that are really as serious about their craft as I am mine. And, I was very fortunate with you know Brad Jackson and Peter Jackson and Jackson Jewelry there in, in Stillwater. So are we talking necklaces or what? what and all the doing? artwork there was designed for men. Mm -hmm. And you know, rings, earrings, necklaces, the whole thing. But the whole approach that what I was doing there, and what I'm very curious about is uh, creating something that represents the person. Almost like a, it'd be like the equivalent of like a monogram, but you find a design or something that represents them that is transferred over and over again into their life. You know, and I like that. That sense is very simple, very elegant. Uh, then you, with the glass work, uh, the large glass works, it's all collaboration with um, with Gus Tietzort here in Oklahoma City with Tietzort Design fourth generation glass family, you know, with, you know, city glass, but he does all the really difficult stuff. You know, his dad and uncles don't even deal with it anymore, you know, it's, <laughs> they give it to him. And Gus is this uber um, competitive um, guy who completely understands where I'm going with what I want. He absolutely understands the economy of movement. And, and so his main graphics guy, uh, Bernie Colbert, has been invaluable in taking my designs, you know, into AutoCADing them so we can get the most precise measurements, get our engineering right. Because, you know, when you're dealing with glass, and particularly the larger glass pieces, mm -hmm. you know, you're really dealing with people's lives. Because, you, you know, glass is such a dangerous, dangerous substance. I mean... And you cannot afford, I'm even talking about liability, because it's not my liability, because I've already covered my liability, you know, in the sense that the glass I use is ballistic grade. I, mean, <laughs> I have way gone beyond an overkill. So, but, you know, you really have to think about those things. So I want the larger pieces to be fully used by kids. I mean, like the larger TVs, you know, they're... they're and they are to scale what a children's TV is. And I want the kids to play with this thing. But, you know, when you have kids around them, you, I mean, well, I'm around and the kids are there, I explain to them, your head's going to give. Your arm's going to give. Your knee's going to give. This isn't giving. <laughs> so they ding themselves once and they never do it again. They love to play in them, which is the purpose. Right, right, yeah. And, and that was a commission for a particular Yeah, the big one is uh, Dick and Jeanette Size, yeah. who honestly, they are they're as important to contemporary Native art as most contemporary Native arts, artists in Oklahoma. I mean, they're the ones who first gave the big breaks to Kelly Haney, Ben Harjo. You go on the list. <laughs> You know, we don't get to do the really cool stuff that we want to do until we get that first break. Right. And that person who believes in you is just as important as you. 
So do you have plans for another sculpture? Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking with some people in Russia. And so, uh, and that will be for the original size. And if that gets done, it'll be about 50 foot. So, hopefully, it's done. (laughs) (laughs) That will be... I honestly believe that our art, particularly Indian country art, we need to leave the United States with it. We do not only ourselves more justice, I think we do our peoples more justice that way. Because then we're really understanding more clearly that we are international artists. Right. So tell me about your creative process a little bit from the time you get an idea. Do you write things down in a notebook? Do you? No. I, I love going on site and watching people um, and sketching. That's how I like to work, preferably. I like to observe. Because it's when I'm observing movement, I'm really able to see what to that person is a critical posture, critical stance, critical to them being able to perform what they're doing in a way that to them is elegant. It's like watching someone who's a chef or someone who's worked serious about cook. There's no, the movement is right in here. It's very, def- very close. You keep things close me- because you're minimizing the space in which you can hurt yourself on, on the elements, whether it's on pots, pans, oven. But also you're minimizing how much space you can do and damage you can do to other people in the area. No big movements with a knife, <laughs> you know? And, and so it's not necessarily very dramatic but that's not what I'm going for. I'm want, when I draw a chef or someone, because I remember doing a whole series with, uh, with Chef Black at, when he first came to Skirvin. Those were fun. And, you know, it was very much just watching them and watching them and then seeing how they moved. And then same with ballet, I, don't, I treat them all the same. There's no difference. But you really like the situations that involve some kind of activity with the movement. Well, not even that. Like if, like if inactivity. Mm-hmm. I think one of, one of my best portraits was of Jan Henry, you know, Robert Henry's wife, when she was just at home with her cats reading her book. That really sticks out in my mind as one of my better pieces. Because it's true. That's how she is. She, when she's not in the dental office working, she wants to be home with those cats reading and probably a glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> you know, and that to me is important, you know, trying to get something that's, that's real. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't like using pictures and photographs is because it's artificial. Then by the time I get it, I mean, I want, like even... When I do family portraits, I want the family members to be dressed in something that is quintessentially them, even if it annoys mom. Actually, the only way I know it's true is if it is annoying mom. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Do you have a creative routine? No. Okay very much, you know, K or drilled it into me. This is a profession. You want to be treated like anybody else? Treat yourself like anybody else. You wouldn't dare hope that you go into a surgeon and say, I'm just not feeling very motivated. You know, I'm not feeling creative. So you, so you do day, every day you do something. Yeah. In terms of work, art work. I meant to ask too. Did she, did she use one line? The one. No, line not at all. She oh. was. A, she was, ex- very much an expressionist. Mm. Fantastic artist. I saw her artwork for the very first time in Johannesburg, at, a, at an art gallery there. 
and it was remarkable. It blew my mind her colors. You know, as, as she got older and you know, developed monocular uh, degeneration, those the colors just became even more outrageous. And she taught me, as an artist, I think for me, what I walked away with, because our work is so different, was two things in terms of pedagogically what to be aware of and then technique wise what I walked away with is I I do not process shadow I process light so, which I think is a huge difference right. it's a huge difference well is there anything we forgot to talk about before we take a look at your artwork no can't think of anything. So, okay, I'm gonna have you talk about this um, piece a so, little bit, and I'm just gonna actually pick up the. Uh, well, how about I just do this? Readjust the camera. Yeah. And that way you'll have this as a still. Let's see. Let me get in focus a little bit here. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. You got it then. And um, this piece is untitled, which I guess is sometimes typical. Of Tell us about your so title. If you'll, if you'll put this down now. here, I can show you some stuff here. Okay. All right, so for my work, it's very rare that I will actually title something. Very rare that I'll title something. Now, I generally will begin somewhere around the head, like on a figure. This one, very much a Plains uh, um, fancy shawl fancy dancer. Shawl. And you know, if anyone knows, for those who don't, I should say, for those who don't know about uh, fancy shawl work or or dancing that they're trying to emulate the butterfly, you know, and so the movements are trying to to express that. And this is on cotton paper, and so on here to give some technique. It's hard to see it, but there's a ridge quality in here. A contoured ridge quality. You see here, 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 all throughout it. This happens from laying the ink in first and then with a flat object before it dries, depressing the areas in a contoured way. And so it keeps that ridge form. Uh, I contrast it here along the edges with with gel ink. Some like this size I'll use a lot of gel pens. I love using gel pens because they so mimic the texture and refraction of our beadwork. You know, they really do look very proximate what the beadwork, how it shimmers in sunlight, you know, or any light. So I like adding that because now what we're seeing too, up, especially up north in Canada, you know, the West Coast, we're going to start seeing here is now you're getting into the face, the shimmering being brought mm -hmm. into the face like the beadwork that they're wearing, which is, I think that's just, that's awesome. And so this idea of the movement and a movement that any dancer, this is a dance posture that they assume a lot. And I like doing that. I, I like yeah. finding, I did a whole series, one, one whole show, five, dan five stances from different styles of dance the dance moves and the movements and postures that the judges would be looking for, mm -hmm. which I think is really good because then when someone goes to a powwow or goes to a dance, if they they can see, oh, so that's what the judge is looking for, and so, and I love, I love drawing this stuff. This actually comes from my own collection. Mm -hmm. I keep pieces back. I didn't want to be caught in a situation. Like when I was at the Jacobson house on the board, it would tear my heart up whenever we would be presenting some descendant, some young daughter or whatever. Uh, the youngest, I remember the youngest child of one of the uh, Kawa Six, uh, her very first and only original piece from her father. That's not right. Mm. And so I decided, you know, long ago that not only pieces that I particularly like myself, 
but I have kept the majority of the most important pieces that have been published or been shown. I've kept them to myself, so that you know, you know, if my artwork does get to the point that it has, you know, a critical value for my tribe, that it can either be donated to the tribe as a living trust from my family, or that it's just in trust for my nieces, nephews, and so. Because I don't want them to get in a situation like that. Did it take you a little while to come up with your signature, or? No, I've had that... that signature for years. Sometimes it's a little bit of a trick deciding where you want to put it. So. I don't know. It's but never it's been. It's always been just right there. I think I did it because I didn't want it to interfere with any of the ink work anywhere else. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's done. It's simple, and it's out of the way, and yeah. you know. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure.